My name is Hallie Leinhardt. I'm the Outreach Specialist for the Center for Financial Security at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Resources for Financial Educators. Our presenters today are Dave Mansell, Director of the Office of Financial Literacy at the Wisconsin Department of Financial Institutions, Carol Maria, Community Affairs Specialist at the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and Peggy Olives, Faculty Associate in Consumer Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and Financial Capability Specialist at the Center for Financial Security and UW Extension. Just a reminder before we get started with the presentations today um, to submit questions to be answered in the Q&A portion that will take place in approximately the last 10 minutes of the webinar please submit your question in the Q&A box located on the left side of your screen. And with that, I will turn it over to Dave. Thank you, Hallie, and uh, thank you for uh, putting on these uh, forums uh, throughout the year. Um, I think it's very beneficial uh, for the folks in the financial literacy and capability field uh, to have a chance to talk about best practices and, and learn about uh, new information. So uh, I think the, the Center for Financial Security at UW-Madison is doing a fantastic job, and I understand there's about 600 uh, people who have registered for this uh, webinar and, and well over 100-plus uh, uh, folks that are on already. So, And, and to those folks, thank you for joining us today. Um, I just commend your passion for promoting personal finance. Uh, it's a, a critical life skill, as you know. Uh, financial literacy is about giving people the tools that they need to achieve their goals uh, for themselves and their families. And so my topic today is Money Smart Week, which really is a great way to get those tools out to the public, and we'll talk about that uh, today. Uh, Money Smart Week um, is a public awareness campaign designed to help consumers better manage their personal finances. So it's a, a public awareness campaign, so we want people to uh, focus uh, for the week and say, hmm, you know, uh, financial literacy, personal finance, these are important topics. I, I really should be thinking about this. And so just uh, through the media and the hype that we try to create during the week, we want the public to get excited about uh, learning a little bit more about their own personal uh, finances and being more financially fit. But the week also has uh, hundreds of events, activities, classes, and courses uh, for the public to attend. And that's really important because uh, with Money Smart Week, um, this is an educational campaign. So no products or services will be sold. Uh, that's a big no-no uh, in the campaign. And the Federal Reserve would not like that if, <laughs> if, uh, if that happened. Um, and so far, the track record has been excellent. So the public feels comfortable uh, coming to these uh, classes. Um, Money Smart Week was created uh, by the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago in 2002. And I said a shout out to Doug Tillett for his vision in, in creating Money Smart Week, and to Alejo uh, Torres, who has just been a phenomenal leader in making this campaign uh, a Midwest uh, initiative, and now it's a national initiative. Uh, back in 2006, uh, Wisconsin uh, conducted the, the first ever statewide campaign. Uh, Wisconsin is part of the uh, Chicago Fed's uh, district, and so we learned about that. In fact, our Governor's Council on Financial Literacy uh, that is made up of over 20 appointees uh, really embraced the, the concept and, in fact, uh, is holding, uh, to this day, uh, Money Smart Weeks uh, in conjunction with the Chicago Federal Reserve and publicly uh, and officially endorses Money Smart Week uh, as an initiative in Wisconsin, which is a bit, little unusual for a state entity to um, actually endorse um, an initiative like this. So they uh, want to make sure the public is aware that uh, this the events during the week are unbiased, uh, no sales pitches, and that the uh, public can feel, uh, you know, comfortable coming to uh, the different events during the week. Um, and then today, uh, the the whole concept has grown into a national campaign, uh, with dozens of states that have uh, statewide um, campaigns. Uh, over 40 states have some sort of activities uh, during the week last year, and now we have national partners. Uh, the first of which was the American Library Association, uh, which is doing a, a phenomenal job of, of getting uh, 
different activities uh, through libraries throughout the nation. Um, and I want to shout out to uh, Lori Burgess. Um, I think I saw your name on the contact list um, at Fond du Lac Library in Wisconsin uh, for introducing that idea to the uh, National uh, or to the American Library Association. Um, so we also have uh, the Financial Planning Association, uh, the Certified Financial Planning Board of Standards, the CFP Board. Um, USDA is also a national uh, partner, and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, so we're in, in, in good company. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention about Money Smart Week uh, is that the beauty of this concept is everyone can be involved. We have um, hundreds of volunteer organizations that uh, during Money Smart Week will put on some type of educational program. And it doesn't have to be something brand new. Maybe you're a bank or credit union and you do a home buying seminar. You can do one during Money Smart Week. Or maybe you're a credit counselor uh, that um, does a, a budgeting uh, workshop. You can do one uh, during Money Smart Week. Um, and so when you collect all these different organizations and, and the types of activities they do throughout the year and focus that in one week, it brings a lot of uh, resources to bear and a lot of uh, attention, which we hope that the media will pick up on and uh, spread the word. So I was asked to um, just to comment on Wisconsin's experience with Money Smart Week. And so I have some statistics here that we'll look at uh, briefly. And yes, that is Bucky Badger in the corner uh, being hugged by Benjamin Franklin, who is the uh, mascot for Money Smart Week. I think Benjamin Franklin is saying thank you to uh, uh, UW-Wisconsin uh, for uh, being in the Final Four uh, for the last two years, uh, although last night we were so-called out-duped. But anyway. Um, so let's take a look at the numbers. Uh, it's important to collect some metrics to see what's actually happening. Uh, these are numbers collected by the uh, volunteers and volunteer organizations. So uh, in our first year, in 2006, we had a attendance over 6,000, um, and then uh, events about over 400. And so one of the themes here, uh, we take a look at uh, last year, 2014, and you'll see that we had over uh, twice as many uh, participants, and about the same number of events. So it's not the number of events that are being held, although you need to have them. Uh, it's really about getting people to the events. Uh, and those could be physical locations, or those could be on webinars. Uh, we even had hotline call-ins uh, for uh, actually in 2008. Uh, we had an uptick in attendance uh, because we had over 1,000 people call into a hotline during uh, uh, the, the financial meltdown uh, a crisis at that time. So there's a different ways to account uh, for attendance. Uh, and then you can see that partners, uh, uh, at least in our state, you know, they kind of come and go. You have uh, the True Blue uh, uh, volunteer partners uh, organizations that stay with you, and then some kind of come and go as they can. And that's okay, um, because just holding out uh, Money Smart Week and declaring that week as a time uh, you will focus on Financial fitness is important, and you will have people who will uh, come every year uh, to participate in that week. So since we've been doing this uh, for many years now, it's important to you know, keep the uh, public uh, excited about the week. Uh, so we try to keep that fresh. Uh, also uh, try to keep the uh, fire lit uh, for all the volunteer organizations. And so there's different ways and different uh, ideas that have been uh, tried out through the years, which makes it uh, fun and exciting. Uh, one simple way to create a little attention is that we had some billboards and yard signs out there. Um, as you can see in the picture, uh, we've had uh, many of these Penny the Pig uh, presentations to kids. This is, uh, they get a, a, a piggy bank that's actually a pig with four slots in it, and that way it teaches them that saving and spending uh, can have categories. Uh, so you can start that concept at an early age. We've had a financial makeover challenge. Uh, this is something that was in the Fox Cities, and it was a local reality TV where they had several families participate and were uh, monitored on TV uh, as they were being helped to become more financially fit. And the winner uh, received a grand prize and the others uh, a runner-up prize. So that was a neat concept. We've had thrift store uh, fashion shows. Uh, you can see those uh, 
uh, women walking down the fashion show aisle with uh, sporting their their new uh, thrift store fashion. Uh, and then you look at the picture in the corner, and yeah, that is a cemetery. Uh, we've had events at a cemetery, believe it or not, and they were quite popular uh, talking about uh, life's uh, last financial uh, planning. Uh, so that's uh, interesting. Um, we've pulled out some celebrity power. Uh, we've had Oprah's debt died coach come in Appleton. Uh, we've had Green Bay Packer Donald Driver speak to a, a group of students at a high school in Milwaukee. Um, and then we've even turned our Capitol Dome green for the week. Uh, it, it just, again, creates more attention, more hype, gets people excited. Uh, you get some free media coverage, which is great. Um, and so that's just another concept. Last year, we participated in the Chicago Federal Reserve's uh, concept for social media. And so they had this placard, We Love Money Smart Week, and that showed up in all sorts of places. Uh, and in this case, uh, we have uh, Budget man uh, holding the sign, uh, and that's at the Green Bay uh, Lambeau Field, Green Bay Packer Lambeau Field. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways to uh, create uh, tension and get people to come to events and learn more about their own uh, financial fitness. Uh, some of the events, uh, some highlights uh, coming up uh, this week or, or this week in um, April uh, is again we'll have the seventh annual Fox Cities uh, Financial Makeover Challenge. Uh, we'll have uh, How to Retire the Cheapskate Way. Um, you'll see uh, several different women's conferences and seminars uh, focused uh, for women um, uh, as, a, as a category. Uh, we'll have a money conference. This is a, a full-day conference for the whole family, um, and it's on a Saturday, and that's targeted to low- to moderate-income uh, individuals. Um, now, you'll see that the third annual, fourth annual, uh, seventh annual, when you have a good idea in a community and people seem to go for it, it, do it again and improve upon that, and you can build. And so that's what's happening here. Um, shred fests are very popular, um, so it's a good uh, Money Smart Week's a good week, a good excuse to do that. Um, schools uh, find that Money Smart Week is a good excuse to do something different. Uh, so they hold these reality fairs, uh, sometimes called reality check. Um, and these are experiential learning um, events uh, for students to learn more about uh, the skill of um, making ends meet over a monthly budget. Uh, another big theme that uh, arised out of, of doing Money Smart Week is uh, the Big Read. Uh, this was developed in 2011 in the Fox Cities area of the state. And uh, basically, it's let's get a book uh, that uh, we're all going to read to uh, uh, kids that are still at an age that uh, like to be read to, so preschoolers up to about third grade. And so the book would focus on a financial topic. Um, this one is, uh, you can see the kids holding up Bunny Money, which is a fun book. Um, and that can be done in the classroom. We have a high school student uh, right now uh, reading to uh, two elementary school uh, kids. Uh, and that was part of a literacy program. And so it was kind of neat to see that the high school students got involved uh, as well. Um, you can have these uh, held at bookstores, or in most cases, they're held at libraries, which is perfectly set up for uh, reading books to, to students or, or to preschool students. Um, as part of what they do. A lot of them will do have a program like that anyway, and you can just add on one more book or one more um, reading session um, during Money Smart Week. And so uh, there's more events. You can find these events on the moneysmartweek.org uh, website. This is uh, managed by the Federal Reserve of Chicago. And so you can choose a state. And uh, what's nice is you can look at events uh, by zip code. You can uh, look by subject matter or by the day of the week. Um, that way you can plan uh, your uh, visit to any of those um, offerings um, in different ways. If you are holding event or want to hold event, it's not too late to upload your event onto the moneysmartweek.org website. Uh, if you haven't done so and you, you do have an event, please register it. And that way you'll get credit for doing it. Uh, you'll uh, have a chance for the public to know about your event. And, um, and if, even if it's a private event, like maybe it's at a classroom, uh, that's OK, because you can put that on there. And that way we can know that it's happening. But it won't show up um, as a public event. Uh, so that's important. 
And then if you, uh, in Wisconsin, we have over 20 different regional planning teams, and that's how we get the uh, planning done throughout the year. So if odds are in Wisconsin, uh, you're near a planning team, um, and you can contact the chairperson of that team or co-chairs um, directly. And so their uh, contact information is on the website as well as other uh, states. And so you can get locally connected right away. Um, and if you're interested in creating a regional planning team uh, for probably next year, it's a little late in the game for this year, but please uh, feel free to contact me and uh, we can get that started. Uh, there's my contact information. So again, Money Smart Weeks is just a, a fantastic way to get involved. Uh, so many people can get involved in their own way and it's really giving people the tools they need to achieve the goals in, in life that they set out to achieve. With that, I'd like to hand over the, the controls to Carol Maria from the FDIC. Well, thanks, Dave. Um, I'm always impressed with this welcoming style and approach, and that's probably why it gets so much stuff done. I'm also grateful for all the work that they're uh, investing in, and many of their partners really are um, very diligent um, providers of financial education throughout the state, so thanks to everyone there. Um, and thanks to all the people on the call for taking time out of your busy schedules. It's often hard to learn how to teach people how to better use their money, and hopefully today will um, build your skills a little bit more. I'm Carol Maria, and I work as a community affairs specialist with the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. And I've worked here for two years. Previously, I worked with community development financial institutions that we're working to increase access to small business lending. So this is my first foray into consumer um, knowledge and skill building. And I have to thank um, Hallie and the team over at the Center for Financial Security. They really uh, helped me grow my skills. So I really appreciate being invited to uh, do this today on the Money Smart curriculum that the FDIC makes available. So. Um, I will focus just on specific tools that the FDIC makes available through a curriculum it calls Money Smart. So as you can see from the slide, it was released in 2001. I'll walk through how you can gain access to it, um, the different formats that it's available on, and um, we'll just move through this um, kind of one thing at a time. So the formats are either, you'll hear me use this language throughout the slide, so I just wanted to define it for you, but we have the instructor-led curricula, and what we mean by that is that the curricula that you would gain access to has a PowerPoint presentation for you to use as an instructor. It has an instructor guide that prepares you to do the presentation, and then it has participant materials or guides that people can take with them after you taught the different modules. Um, it's also available, the Money Smart curricula is also available self-paced. And so what we mean by that is computer-based computer instruction. Those are really limited to the adults and young adults courses that we make available. And that's usually only available in English and Spanish. But the real um, benefit to many organizations we work with is that it produces a certificate of completion. And then we also make these things available on a podcast network. So I'm mostly going to talk about the instructor-led curriculum and the self-paced curricula. So. so this is the landing page if you go to the FDIC website. And you can see in that gray space bar um, all the Money Smart curricula. The curriculum is available free of charge. and um, you can uh, navigate uh, to different um, areas of the slide to find it. So here is the landing page for Money Smart for Adults. Um, while we're on the landing page, you can see that each separate curricula has um, a description for the contents. And here you see that it says that Money Smart has 11 different modules, and they're all structured identically. Um, but cover different subject matter. Um, the instructor guide teaches um, you how to walk through each of the curriculum. If taught in their entirety, each module takes about an hour of classroom time to teach. The FDIC created a layering matrix to insist instructors wanting to break down or customize topics, subtopics, or activities pre-formatted in each module. 
Additional resources have been released, and I'll provide you with links to these at the end of today's comments, but they also include a Teachers Online Resource Center um, that offers teachers resources available through either the FDIC or the CFPB to teach children from pre-K through age 20 about money and other financial topics. And then we also created in partnership um, with another organization, a parent and caregiver resource webpage. This next slide is the landing page for the web-based learning. So you can see that the consumer would have to create a username or password. And um, then the computer-based internet instruction would track the learner through their um, series of modules because there's um, 11 modules for adults and eight modules for young adults. And um, when they complete with an 80% proficiency, they can produce a certificate of completion. You can also order these on DVD, which we find many organizations prefer to use um, because of the internet connections that are available on site. You can go to our website and order those DVDs. Now let's look at each curriculum individually. So this is what the Money Smart DVD curriculum packet looks like. It says our name, it tells you all the languages that it's available, and the subject matter of each of the 11 modules. This DVD provides a comprehensive, fully scripted guide for instructors, PowerPoint slides that are modifiable or in PDF format, and it provides you with the take-home guide for participant that includes tools and information um, the students or consumers could use independently after completing a module. It also provides you with pre and post tests and a teaching guide. So we often find these are used for small group settings or large classroom settings. We often find that um, the users of these materials modify them. For example, many community organizations will partner with a bank and then both the um, bank and the community organization can put their logos on the PowerPoint to ensure that the consumers understand and remember where they access the training. Additionally, a key feature of the Money Smart CD is the layering matrix table that appears in the instructor guide for each module. Here you'll find a table that gives you about how many minutes on different subjects within the module, um, like 10 minutes for discussion or five minutes to explain a different subject matter. As you can see from the slide, it's available in many languages, and I'll clarify that because it's not very clear, but English, Chinese, Haitian, Creole, Hindi, Hmong, Korean, Russian, Spanish, and Vietnamese. We also have a, a DVD that's available for the visually impaired as well that produces Braille. So again, these are all um, free of charge, and that page I showed you earlier will allow you to order them, either in downloadable modules, some of the modules you can download, or you can order the CD. So I just wanted to remind everybody that FDIC Community Affairs Specialists are in most states, and we can help you um, devise a technical assistance plan to create partnerships in your community. So the next slide is for Money Smart for Young Adults. You can see the eight modules it offers on the slide. Again, we um, provide you with the PowerPoint instructor guide and participant materials. We wanted to remind listeners that Money Smart for Young Adults is aligned with the educational standards for all 50 states, the District of Columbia, Guam, and the Virgin Islands. It's also um, aligned with the Jumpstart Financial Education Standards and the National Council on Economic Education Standards. Recently, the um, FDIC and the SBA came up with Money Smart modules for people who are entrepreneurs. And so we have these different um, modules available for them. This uh, fall, I expect two more modules, possibly three will come out for the small business um, school. And then we have also Money Smart for older adults. This was 
prepared jointly by the FDIC and the CFPB to raise awareness to prevent financial exploitation and encourage better planning and decision making around issues that face older adults. For those of you who don't know, the CFPB was created um, just a while back and their website really has a variety of blogs, discussion groups, and materials focused on financial education and building the strength of consumer financial resilience. So often we get the question, how do I learn how to do um, Money Smart? And I just want to make sure everyone's aware that we provide a variety of services around Train the Trainer for Money Smart. We do it uh, via video. There's YouTube videos. Um, sometimes your local community affairs specialist will conduct workshops. And I believe it's quarterly. The FDIC actually hosts webinars to uh, go through the different curriculums, the different instructor uh, materials that are available, and encourage you to be a better teacher of the Money Smart curriculum. So this slide really pro pro provides you with a large overview of the Money Smart benefits. I think the most common recited benefit is that it's free. We often find people say it's easy to teach because the a la carte approach um, really allows people to modify things so it really meets the needs of the consumers in their community. The last thing I wanted to make sure people were aware of is the FDIC Consumer News is published twice annually. Um, it provides a lot of different tips. Each consumer news is generally 8 to 10 pages in length, 5 to 15 articles, and you can reprint any of the articles. They often focus on one thing. I put the slide on here, financial tips for seniors, because that meets a nice target audience, but we also did one focused on uh, student needs. Um, so I really um, recommend you go to the portion of the website for those articles. Um, and then these are some of the web-based resources I thought. Um, I mentioned um, some of the newer ones are the ones for teachers and parents, and then the Money Smart um, landing pages. And finally, this is my contact information. If you have questions about who might be the community affairs specialist in your area or specific questions on financial education the FDIC promotes, please let me know. And then I'm going to pass this on to Peggy Olive, and she'll continue with a variety of other resources. Thank you, Carol. And yes, my name is Peggy. I'm with the University of Wisconsin. And um, I think one of the reasons we wanted to have this webinar focused on resources for financial education is because there's so many good materials out there. And um, Carol had mentioned the CFPB, and they did a study in 2013 and found that an average of $2 per person per year is spent on financial education versus $54 per person per year is spent um, on marketing financial services. So you know, I guess that just makes us you know, do more with less and making the best use of the resources. So for my part of the, the webinar, I'm going to focus mostly on resources for adult education. Um, I think youth education could probably be a whole other webinar. Um, and I'm probably going to be moving along at a fairly fast clip just to get a lot of information out there. Um, but just to remind you that this webinar will be um, posted on the CFS website following um, the presentation today, probably within the next few days, so that you can go back and view any of those links or those resources. So just a reminder there. Um, if you've been doing financial education, oh, maybe more than a week or so, uh, you've probably caught on that there is no one best curriculum. There's no good one-size-fits-all. Um, people are very complex and their needs are complex. And even what you want to present into a financial education workshop or even a one-on-one -on -one meeting um, is really going to depend on the individual's need and what they need for financial well-being. Uh, maybe they need information or skills. You could pick up a module from the FDIC curriculum focused on what they might need. Um, or maybe they need access to resources or even access to some of this information. And maybe there's influences like the social media and the social influences. So getting together with neighbors for Money Smart Week could really help get that motivation going. So even keeping in mind what 
an individual might need in their financial education. Uh, we also think about the different financial skills an individual needs across their lifespan. And um, this is a model we use here in Wisconsin. It, five of these six financial skills come directly from the uh, Federal Financial Literacy and Education Commission, or FLEC. Um, and then we added that setting goals, um, because we thought it was important to kind of know where you're going. Um, and that, I think, helps increase motivation, too. So getting people focused on what's important to them um, before they go out of the gate to look at how can we make the most of what we have. So even keeping an eye on you know, which skills are people interested in, uh, who's your audience, and which life stage are they in. Um, and if you're thinking about the question, what curriculum should I use, some of the recommendations that came from the President's Advisory Council on Financial Capability are really thinking about finding those materials and putting together information that helps emphasize behaviors in addition to knowledge, so not just what do people need to know, but what are they going to do with this information. Um, connect learning and doing to just in time, so whatever life stage they're in, try to focus on that or some of the common themes. Um, repetition across the lifespan. Uh, integration, are there other ways we can incorporate more financial literacy and financial information into existing services? And then all those other factors, your delivery, your effectiveness, timing, and the whole mix that I've been talking about. So I'm going to provide a snapshot of resources, uh, looking at some just general financial publications, fact sheets, guides, a good place to start for those materials. I'll highlight a few free financial curricula that are out there, either printed or available online. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, that integration piece, financial education and social services and then looking at assessment and evaluation. So we're out there doing all this. Um, how can we track you know, what comes of all of our participants? With the, um, I guess looking at the first place to find some good publications, fact sheets, and guides, it's the mymoney.gov. And again, this is from FLEC, the Financial Literacy and Education Commission. And this is their clearinghouse of information. And they have it categorized by their five different financial skills. And plus, they have different life events that a person might go through um, depending on, on what different life stage they might be at. So that's a great place to just go and find some different calculators, some different fact sheets if you want to mix and match and put together your own materials for your own program. And again, all of that is free. It's put together by a government agency, so you can use that in any of your programming. And um, Carol had talked about the CFPB, and they have a website that hopefully everyone has checked out, their consumerfinance.gov. And they have some features on there. They have their Get Assistance. You can ask CFPB some frequently asked questions. And you can also select different topics. So they have, um, they have some excellent information on student loans, um, on home ownership. And then Carol has also talked about some of the other resources that they've been creating. Um, and I have noticed, too, with some of the information on the uh, CFPB website, they also have uh, nine different languages that these materials are available in. Um, also, something that I turn to frequently is our federalextension.org website, where it's a network of cooperative extension specialists from across the US um, who all participate with materials and um, ask an expert column they have in there. And again, you can, they have webinars, they have some hot topic sections, and um, they have materials based on various life stages or events. So you can get on there and anything is free to use, or you can even follow up and contact your local Cooperative Extension Service if you're looking for additional materials. Um, a few that I wanted to highlight here at the University of Wisconsin, we do have a, a, a web page that we've put together because we do some training for other helping professionals. Uh, social workers, case managers, other financial counselors. So there's a web page that's free and open to the public where we have those six financial skills. And we have different handouts, different fact sheets, different worksheets 
that you can download and print off, and um, anyone is welcome to use it. It's just a collection of materials that we use more frequently. We also, as a way to kind of keep up our skills across Wisconsin, we have a monthly uh, lunch and learn. And most often, our, our speaker for those uh, WIS lines, we call them, they're kind of teleconference calls, is Michael Collins. So he's a great resource we have in Wisconsin. And every month, there's a different topic. You can see along the left-hand column of categories, we talk about debt management evaluation, financial coaching, financial literacy. So um, you are welcome to get on there. There's usually a three or four page brief on these different topics that has some insight, some facts, some resources for financial educators. And then it has an MP3 file, so you can listen to the teleconference call um, on that topic. So they go back several years, and it really provides some good insight into what's happening um, with that financial topic, just as a way for us to increase our own skills. Um, and I saw this when uh, FDIC had their materials up, but thinking about a bank on uh, coalitions, if maybe you have uh, your community has a local bank on initiative, and they have some wonderful resources for financial education. Um, uh, getting together to do some of the information um, and the activities if you're going to have a Money Smart week. So checking out, um, even if you don't have a local bank on, you can still access their financial education materials and their resources and find out a little bit more about other events that are happening in your area. Um, and finally, just a snapshot of some of the other tools that are out there. There's some great financial calculators. You could link to if you have a website or even um, have some of your learners check these out. Of course, there's the National Endowment for Financial Education, NEFI, has their smartaboutmoney.org that has some wonderful materials and calculators. Um, EBRI uh, runs the choosetosave.org, and they have uh, several, I think a whole screen full of different financial calculators um, based on different life stages and life events. And then finally, the Financial Security Project at Boston College, their uh, squared away calculators. I just have a screenshot of a few of them. Um, but there's different topics, and you can kind of click on those and check out their calculators too. And again, all of these are free for use and no login required. Uh, so turning our attention to looking a little bit more at financial curricula, if you're not into building your own and kind of the mix and match, um, there are some set curricula in addition to the FGIC's Money Smart. So the first one I have listed on here is from the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. And they have um, two different tracks, they, as you can see on there, because they have uh, information for teachers and students. So they have uh, one track is geared for high school or college age. And then the other set of materials are looking more at um, just general adult consumers. And the printed materials you can print off online are available in English and Spanish. Um, it looks like the online materials are in English only. And then also the they have tablet and mobile uh, views for if you have an iPad or Nexus, you can use that. But that looked like it was only available in English at this time also. And what's kind of interesting about this is they have, especially for the online, they have case scenarios. So they have um, four or five different um, situations there. And you dig into the information looking about with this individual's financial situation, what is it they need to know. So it gives you a chance to learn the information, applying it to someone else, and then hopefully learning along the way. So you can even just use the case scenarios if you have a curriculum you're already using. Uh, there's also a curricula available through the US Department of Labor. And this one has a focus on savings and more specifically looking at ways to start saving and budgeting so you can have an eye on retirement. Um, it's written for really any age group, but again, it's thinking about you know trying to plan now for your later years. And it's available in English and Spanish. And it's available online, or you can print out the curriculum. Um, I guess a bonus of doing it online or having a learner do it online is that there's some interactive worksheets. So you can enter your information right uh, on your computer, and then it, it 
has like the built-in calculators and the tools that you can fill out. Um, it is very text dense, so a lot of words as you can see in there. Um, another curricula, thinking about older adults and some of their special needs, uh, is the AARP Finances 50 Plus. And um, what's a little bit different about that is that they have, um, well, they have the curricula you can print off online, but they're also um, happy to mail out bulk so you can order the, the workshop guides. And they have um, the participant work manuals, and then they have a facilitator manual, but they also have built in for a mentor. So they have information on working with uh, mentors and volunteers in your community to match up your participants with a mentor to check in on them and see how they're doing with their financial goals. So again, it's incorporating more of that action and that behavior into the learning. Uh, additional financial curricula looking at specifically at web-based materials. Um, I just picked two that really have some good solid information. Uh, the University of California and then University of Illinois Extension Services. Um, you can see they're both available in English and Spanish, and they're self-paced online, um, just looking at different parts of basic budgeting. You do have to register for each of those, but uh, again, it's free, and um, it's, you don't get spam or anything like that. So it's a good resource to share with your learners um, if there's some opportunity for them to do a self-paced information. I also wanted to talk a little bit about that integration of how can we get more financial education out there and perhaps even looking at some of the existing social services, some different agencies, and what financial information and financial education materials are already existing for that. So NEFI, I would mentioned, who has the um, Smart About Money, they have the high school financial planning series that some high schools use across the US. Um, they also put together workshop kits for all of those audiences you can see in the screenshot. Some different special situations, addiction, domestic violence, gambling. Um, they have some transitional housing. They have uh, information geared toward low income specifically, general information, health, disability, aging. Um, so they have different categories where they've already done a lot of the legwork. They have. Um, you can kind of build your own based on some of the different categories and the different information. And then they provide, if you click on those links, they have a PowerPoint that's already put together. They have a script to go along with it. And then they have handouts. So it really has it ready to go. And like I said, you can kind of mix and match based on your needs and your population. Um, and again, all of that is free for use. So um, again, with the CFPB, they have uh, Your Money, Your Goals, they just rolled out this past summer, with a focus on financial education and financial empowerment for social service programs. And maybe some of our participants on the webinar today have already checked out those materials, or maybe you're using them. Um, so they have a toolkit in English and in Spanish that you can download online. And it has a lot of the background information about some of those basic financial skills. And then they also provide information about training others on how to use this information with their own clientele. So um, if you're, as a financial educator, if you're working with some human service agencies, you can download these materials and kind of walk the human service agencies, uh, the staff members, through the materials and how they might use this with their clientele. Um, because while we're comfortable and familiar with how to talk to people about money, um, social services and case managers or home visitors, they might not be as comfortable. So it really helps just increase the comfort level for themselves and then using it with other people. And they do provide some a pre and a post training survey and also a follow up after the fact. Um, so looking at more ideas about integration with social services or some of our other community partners, um, just in, increasing our outreach with financial education. The, um, you can see the US Department of Health and Human Services, their administration of, for children and families. 
um, they have this toolkit that they've put together, um, similar to some of the CFPB materials. It's designed for individuals who work with youth in foster care, though. So it's very specific to um, those young adults who are aging out or have been in the foster care system and now are going to be responsible for their own finances. So it talks about some of those special issues that young adults might run into. And they have a series of tip sheets for youth um, focused on that topic. Um, similar to that theme, the Annie E. Casey Foundation also has uh, curriculum and some materials that focus on um, youth who are aging out of the foster care and then some of the issues that they might have um, that are unique to their situation. Um, one thing that always jumps out at me when I look at these materials is are the um, credit issues that a, a young adult might have. Um, perhaps if someone else in their family has used their social security number or there's been some identity theft and yet no one wants to file that police report. So it's how to help individuals work on those credit issues, those disputes, the fraud. Um, and it's written in a way that a um, person doesn't have to be a financial expert, but it helps guide them through how to work with youth and kind of increasing their skills. Um, there is another one, too, uh, looking specifically at domestic violence, and it was a partnership by a national coalition on domestic violence and all state. And they have um, their financial empowerment curriculum that has 12 modules. And it really is looking at just financial basics, but they put a lens on that that might have um, some unique issues or some special issues from a domestic violence situation. So if that's a clientele that you work with or a community partner, um, just another good resource that can help expand um, their ability to work with people around finances. And again, you can download and print off that curriculum and it's available in English or in Spanish. Or you can do an online self-paced, but I believe that was only in English. Um, I guess putting a plug-in for another University of Wisconsin resource. We have a Money Smart in Head Start, unrelated to FDIC's Money Smart, it's, but we're free to use that name and materials, I understand. Um, so this is looking at our integration of financial education with families whose children are enrolled in Head Start or Early Head Start. So we have, um, anyone can download and use these materials. There's two workshops. Um, with the PowerPoints and the handouts and the surveys that one focuses on um, uh, budgeting and savings and the other is on credit and debt. There are eight financial newsletters that are basically two-sided, two pages um, written in English and in Spanish that anyone is welcome to um, download and use. Uh, here in Wisconsin, most of those newsletters are just sent home with the kids and then online there's a survey that looks at um, did families read it? What did they get from the newsletters at the end of the school year? So again, all of those materials are um, free for anyone to use. And if you have a, a program like that with a home visitation, you know, it's a great, great information to use with young families. Um, also, looking at, um, I mentioned our newsletter survey, thinking about ways to assess and look at how our financial education efforts are going. Um, we have the uh, NEFI, which is a resource I've talked about a few times here. They have a very extensive, um, I guess by extensive I mean it's 116 pages, but they have very extensive evaluation toolkit. Um, they do have a quick start guide if you're just looking for some highlights there. Um, but you can download that and it has a manual of different things to consider if you're going to do a program assessment or an evaluation. And then they also have a database of different templates that you can use for a pre or a post or a follow-up or depending on what you want to use for your programming. And it looks at a range of what we could call CASA, the knowledge, attitude, skills, and actions. So you can focus in on what is it that you want to do, what outcomes do you want to see, is it more about knowledge, attitudes, or do we want to see some action in our follow-up survey. Um, so as I mentioned, they have pre-post, they have different impact indicators. Um, you do have to register to download this, but it is free of charge. I bet they're just trying to track people who are using those materials. 
Um, there also is a, a very new uh, assessment tools, um, a three-part uh, series that's coming out from CFED, the Corporation for Enterprise Development. And they partnered with Bank of America for these materials. And um, they have three different topics you can download and check out. One is identifying outcomes for your program. Um, one is creating a logic model. And then the third will be and that series is on impact indicators. So again, just if you have a program you're working with or your agency, um, a way to kind of look at the bigger picture and then how can we drill down and, and really assess our information. Um, and then finally, again, another plug for the University of Wisconsin. Um, through the Center for Financial Security has developed a um, it's anywhere from six to eight questions, depending on how you want to use it. There's a survey of questions where um, they've really done the research to look at what questions of self-reported information are indicative of uh, financial well-being and, and looking at those financial health behaviors. So they've created these six, six to eight questions into a financial security scale. So if an individual takes these questions before a workshop and then takes the survey again two or three months following a workshop, you can compare, combine the, the scores from the first survey and the second survey and compare how that's doing. It's, there's a picture of measurement tools like a, bread, a blood pressure cuff um, because it's kind of comparing that benchmark of how they're doing beforehand and then measuring again at another point in time and how is an individual doing later on. And it's just one page. It's pretty quick and easy to use. But again, it's self-reported. So it's just nice to add to that mix of different ways to see um, how we're doing with our programming. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Haley. Thanks, Peggy. And thank you, Carol and Dave, as well. You guys um, provided a wealth of information um, to our listeners. and. Um, I would love to start the question and answer portion now, as we do have some excellent questions that are coming in. Um, I'm going to start first with a question directed towards Carol. And this um, is regarding the modules in the Money Smart curricula. Are they, um, can they be used on their own individually? Are they best used all together in that particular order? Or can they be taken kind of, um, I guess you would say piecemeal um, as a as a person might need a certain topic area? Well, the answer is it depends. Um, it depends on what your community need is and the target of your, um, or the goal of your educational um, session. So we always recommend that people assess what the community they serve needs. And then if a module meets that specific need, you could use the module in its entirety. Um, but like here in Milwaukee, I've learned that oftentimes the uh, goal is to address a community need. It falls into two modules. And then I'll often work with our partners to combine two modules or possibly three modules to address all the things that are specifically needed um, in that context. So I kind of did that. It depends and gave some, some scenarios. Great. Um, and then I'm going to send a question over to Dave. And this is, regard, this is about um, maybe communities who have not necessarily um, um, really gotten into the Money Smart Week um, activities, or maybe it's just starting. But in your experience, especially for communities that may be small or have um, fewer resources or fewer people acting in this area, um, what's one of the best kind of starting points for a community? What's a good um, starting um, event or activity that can really kind of um, raise awareness and boost this um, financial literacy Money Smart Week um, initiative? Well, first, um, it, I think the most important thing is to get started. And a lot of times that's just one or two people that say, we want to do this in our community, no matter how small. And so they meet and they say, who, should, uh, who else should be at the table? And uh, that could be someone from the school district. Maybe it's a credit union, a bank, insurance uh, agent or company. Um, uh, we've had utilities uh, involved because um, they'd like to have their uh, 
bills paid as well, and sometimes it just is a matter of some financial coaching uh, to, to make that happen. So uh, you convene this meeting, um, and maybe you get someone from uh, a, like a regulatory agency like uh, my agency, the Department of Financial Institutions, because um, that then kind of creates a sort of a neutral uh, playing field. Uh, and then so you have that conversation. Uh, you could even uh, patch in or have someone from the uh, Chicago Federal Reserve uh, be involved uh, because they can provide resources um, that could be anything from uh, dollars to getting things printed um, for advertising, for kickoff events, um, uh, even uh, handouts like uh, uh, posters and uh, other materials like uh, bookmarks and these kinds of things they can provide in quantity. So knowing that there's other people involved uh, can get the ball rolling. And then you can plan, let's say, one event uh, or uh, be involved at a library and say, let's have a bunch of, of uh, events at that library. Uh, so it's a neutral place to, to meet and for the public to come to. So there's, you know, again, getting started, uh, no matter how humble, uh, and then trying something and then knowing that next year you can add on to that. If you're in Wisconsin, give me a call. Uh, if you're outside of Wisconsin, I would suggest calling the Chicago Federal Reserve, and that's at that website, moneysmartweek.org. Great information. Thanks, Dave. Um, and then I have a question for Peggy. So, Peggy, you went through um, a lot of information and a lot of different um, curriculums and that were aimed at a variety of different audiences, different populations. Um, and so I guess one of the questions is, if you're in an organization where you're actually working with a variety of different people, different um, populations, is it advisable to use a variety of different um, curricula, or should you try to um, stick with one? Um, what would be your What would be your take on that? Um, I could see the benefits of staying with one curricula if you are new to doing this, um, because the way most of the curricula are designed is are that they're very comprehensive and they include all of those you know little little bits of information you might need about the budgeting or the credit and if you do mix and match you might miss um, a piece of information that would help create a clear picture but you know if you've been doing this for a while and you know your audience and you know the topic you know let's say you're doing about credit and you'll know what specific information is most important for your audience about credit, then I think you can be feel free to mix and match the information. So take the best worksheets or the most timely information about credit or whatever's based at best at your audience, knowing your audience best. Um, so again, the more you know about the topic and the more you know you about the audience, I think you can create even better materials when you do a little mixing and matching. Um, once you have a good handle on you know, what it is you're doing with your financial education. Great. And I think actually we're going to have to cut it off right there uh, with the question and answer portion. Um, I, would like to, I would love to thank Peggy and Dave and Carol. You guys were excellent today with just um, tons of information for our, for our audience. Um, I would also like to note that we do have some additional resources and updates for um, our, our viewers. We have a newly, newly released CFS brief that's now on our website, Tools for Teaching Financial Concepts to Low-Income Families. There's a link right there. Um, we do have an upcoming Money Smart Week event that's taking place here at CFS. It's a Twitter chat that will be hosted by CFS um, Director J. Michael Collins and Justin Sidnor. That'll actually, I did not um, put in the date, but that will be on Tuesday, April 21st from 1 to 2 p.m. More information will be available on our website regarding that Twitter chat, cfs.wisc.edu. Um, and then I also would like to note that we do have an upcoming webinar in May, May 19th exactly, and that will be Sarah Halpern Meekin speaking on her newly published book, It's Not Like I'm Poor, How Working Families Make Ends Meet in a Post-Welfare World. Um, 
And I also would like to remind everybody that this webinar will be archived on our website. Um, like Peggy said, it should just be within a few days. Um, however, the PowerPoint from this webinar with all the information presented by our three excellent presenters will be posted on our website um, very shortly following this webinar today. And with that, I would just like to say thank you so much for everyone tuning in and have an excellent day.